Hello, Jim here. I've been trading options for a number of years and making some really good extra income, and it's had a big impact on my ability to be financially independent. Today, I want to talk about how it impacts you retirement-wise. I believe that I don't need anywhere near as much money as I originally thought I needed. I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about all the different types of income streams that it generates for retirement. And then I'm going to share with you my budget and also some of the trades I think are really good trades during retirement. So stay tuned. I think you're really going to enjoy what I have for you. Okay, let's jump right in. I'd like to give a quick market update at the beginning of most of my videos. It's been a crazy couple of weeks, and I think that's going to continue. We're going to have a lot of volatility. You know, some days will be good, some days will be bad. And that bodes well for most options traders. It gives us opportunities to pick up some really good premium. I also think the Fed will do a cut next week. I'm thinking a quarter point. And I believe most of the pundits are thinking the same thing, but I do think over the next six months, I'm guessing they're probably going to do maybe a few more cuts, um, maybe overall cut by 1%, maybe in the next six months. So at least that's my two cents. And as usual, it's probably only worth two cents. So let's jump right into the main topics. So I'm really close to what most people would say would be retirement for some weird reason, the government, uh, you can access your retirement accounts at 59 and a half. I'm going to be 59 next month. So I literally have maybe a little bit, well, exactly from today, about seven months until I can access my retirement accounts. So I look at retirement kind of in stages. So pre-retirement is before you hit that 59 and, and a half. Now, some people may retire a little bit early or be financially independent. I'm financially independent, but I still work because I want to. I like what I do and I like the people I work with, uh, primarily because I'm a software consultant as well as doing this YouTube channel. I, I enjoy doing both and I really enjoy helping other people. So I have one client left for my software consulting and I like working with him. He's easy to work with and he's been a friend for many years, over 10 years. So he's probably my last client. It's probably my last consulting project that I'll have going forward. At least at this point, that's what I'm, I'm thinking. So the pre, what I like to call early retirement or pre-retirement may be kind of a mix. It may not be, it may be more financial independence. And that's what I, I encourage. I think if people retire too young or too early, it can be a negative thing. Now, if you're just trying to get to be financially independent so you can do what you want to do, when you want to do it, with who you want to do it with, then that's a whole different ball game. Now, I also like to consider the, you know, once you hit 59 and a half like myself in seven months, that's kind of the mid mid stage. So you're not fully retired, but you can access your retirement accounts. I probably won't use mine. They're there if I need them, but I'm probably going to use my taxable accounts. And since I make pretty good money selling options, I probably won't access, um, again, my retirement accounts. I'll continue to sell options and grow them. Um, you know, but I'm probably not going to be pulling money out until I get into what I call full retirement. That's when you start taking Social Security. For me, it'll probably be 67. A lot of people may keep working if they love their work till, you know, 72. I think that's when you can take, you know, the top most Social Security. But I'm thinking 67. I've had health issues in the past. Hopefully I don't have any in the future. But I'm probably going to take it around 67 and then probably do fewer work-related things. Uh, I may do more traveling a little. Some of the stuff I've put off a little bit. I don't want to put them off too long. I don't want to put, you know, fun traveling and doing things that maybe in my 70s I can't do or my 80s. My dad's 85 and he's still working. So at least that's the way I think about it. And I plan it that way. At the end of this video, I'm going to share with you my budget and how I've set it up for these stages. So I look at early retirement one way, I look at mid-retirement another way, and then full retirement in a completely different manner. And it it's not just my budgeting, it's also how 
you know, what I plan to earn and how I plan to earn it. And I'm also impacted a lot by Social Security, the fact that you can, you know, get that income stream. Um, it does impact the way you, I plan and the way I think most people should plan. Now, one of the wonderful things about selling options, and I'm, I'm an investor first and then a trader. I do have in my membership a lot of people who are just pure traders, but then I also have a lot of people who are like myself who are investors. And, you know, so I'm not just trading options to make money. I'm also trying to improve on my portfolio. I'm trying to pick, you know, the companies that will grow really well. Uh, but in the meantime, I'm picking up a lot of cash flow. I'm picking up um, cash flow from selling what's called covered calls. People are willing to pay me money for the potential to own my stock down the road. I'm also earning income from uh, cash secured puts or vertical put credit spreads. And that, to me, still kind of blows my mind. That's what I learned about three years ago when I started this process, that someone will pay me for the opportunity to sell me stocks or ETS, it still kind of blows my mind that that such a market exists and you can do quite well with it. Um, now it's not get rich quick, it's, it's, it, but it can really augment your current income and you can do really well with it. And then when you add in dividends, um, I'm also a dividend investor. I've always been a dividend investor. So I, I received some pretty good dividends. And again, you'll see in the spreadsheet at the end of this video, all the breakdown, how much I'm earning from dividends and how much I plan to earn down the road, how much I'm earning from premiums, and now interest. Now with the Fed having increased rates so high, I'm earning some really good interest, especially in Fidelity at, at around 5% on a month, on a yearly basis. And it adds up quite a bit. And I can earn that on my cash that I'm using to sell cash secure puts and vertical put credit spreads which is, you know, so it's kind of like a double whammy. I'm, I'm earning income from selling cash secured puts and vertical put credit, credit spreads. People are paying me, again, for the opportunity to buy or to sell me shares. But then the fact that I can also earn interest on that too, it's, it's really, really nice in the sense. It, it adds up to quite a bit of money. And then, you know, I can always continue to work and I could work part-time. And that's something I've thought about too. If I get back into golf, I may work at a pro shop a couple hours a week, but it gives me an opportunity, you know, if, if I do want to continue to work and of course I'll continue to do YouTube and I continue to help people. So that, that kind of work I'm going to continue because I really want to get the word out. I want people to understand it's a great tool. Selling options is a great tool to have in your tool chest. Um, it can really kind of make make or break you. It gives you the opportunity to retire with a lot less than you would ever imagine. You know, so if you're thinking, well, I need a million dollars to retire and you have these pundits, you know, talking, well, you need a million, two million, three million. I've done previous videos where I show you could actually retire on 200,000, 300,000. The numbers I'm going to share with you in today's spreadsheet are actual numbers from my portfolio. So it's kind of a real world look at, at what I'm expecting and planning. Um, you know, so I, I just wanted to share that because it, it, it can have a dramatic impact. You don't need as much money. Now, there is a learning curve with learning how to trade options. And, but I encourage people to get started. You know, it's kind of like the old proverb of, you know, teach a man to fish versus giving him a fish. It, it's can make such a difference and anyone can do it. Any brokerage account it, you know, I know by Fidelity, Schwab, <clears throat> you know, Tasty and all the other different brokerages, you can do it and you can kind of learn and then actually hold your hand along the way, which is really nice. That's how I got started. I had some um, traders from the trader desk help me at Schwab and kind of help me get started with selling covered calls. So, and then you can also use what I like to call the, or what's called the 4% rule. I call it the 2 to 4% rule. So you can also look at potentially selling some of your highly appreciated assets or, you know, stocks or ETFs that maybe have gone through the roof. Or if you're a NVIDIA person and your stock is shot, you know, a thousand times, 
you know, it's grown a th- by a thousand percent. And I, I actually own some NVIDIA and actually it's more like 2000 percent. It's it's absolutely ridiculous. But you could sell some of that, too, and then bring in some income. You know, the four percent rule is been studied quite a bit. Um, I think it's a good basis to go by that you can liquidate maybe four percent of your account and it would last, you know, and you adjust it for inflation, but it'll last quite a long time, probably. And what they found is a lot of people are dying with with more money than they they ever expected. So, you know, I say two to four percent, meaning if you don't need the full four percent, well, then only do two percent. But don't, you know, don't hold back from doing the things you want to do. Go travel, go, you know, visit your grandchildren, you know, play tennis, play golf, you know, what, whatever kind of floats your boat. So, um, so I just wanted to mention that it, it's always, once I learned about the 4% rule, it was kind of, it kind of changed my perspective on a lot of things. Just thinking, wow, having this portfolio and it doesn't, again, doesn't necessarily need to be so huge. And I can potentially live off of around 4% of it. Um, has been kind of a wake up call and that I probably learned that 15 or 20 years ago. So I also wanted to talk about some key uh, strategies I like to use to earn cash. And I think these are really good for when you're in retirement. I'll go into more detail in the next part of, of this video. But in an essence, there's two strategies I like. One is what's called the vertical put credit spread. So when you really find a stock or an ETF, and I always push the point, pick really good companies, not just good companies, but also companies that aren't too pricey, too expensive. Then you can sell what's called a cash secured put um, and you add some protection. So when you're in a market where you don't know what's going to happen, you buy that protection and it becomes a spread, meaning it limits how much downside you have. So, you know, if you're looking at a hundred dollars stock and you buy a spread that's $10 wide, you're protected. You won't have a bigger loss than that $10, even if the stock drops, you know, 50, 60, $70 because of a major market crash. But you can rerun these every month. You can even do it on ETFs. I found doing it on IWM and XLE, which I don't believe I own any XLE. I know I don't own any IWM and I've been, they probably have been some of the most common trades that I've done. And I've done fairly well with them, taking a little bit less risk and maybe doing a couple more contracts if it warrants it at that time. And then another strategy is what I call the iron condor. So if you have a stock that kind of moves some, but not a huge amount, you can do what's called the iron condor. So you want that stock to stay in the middle. You set up a call on the top side and a put on the bottom and you take very little risk since you're doing two at the same time you take a lot less risk both on the top side and the bottom side with the goal of the stock just staying in between those two wings they're typically called wings and by doing that you can earn some really good income and I've done that with IWM a lot of people will do it with SPY some people will do it with QQQ now if if we have a serious correction and both those you know SPY has come down some and so is QQQ but it I may also start trading those. I, I prefer IWM because it's a little bit easier on the wallet. It's t- around a little more than 200. I think it's $204. I think QQQ is four or 500 and I think SPY is five or 600. So that's the main reason I just choose IWM because I, it's a little less expensive. So, and then what's also really critical when you want to retire, is you really have to have a budget. You really need to know what you're spending. So I have this retirement budget. Again, I share it with all my members. So after I post this video, and I, I will share this video with my membership, <clears throat> I will um, also upload the spreadsheet so that they can access. If you're more, if you're curious about my memberships, details will be in the description. I ha- I have three levels. I have the Investor Club, Traders Club and coaching club, the investor club, you get access to my Patreon, you get access to all my trades, you get access to all my spreadsheets and pretty much all my collections within Patreon. The Trader Pro or Trader Club 
is the next step up. You also get everything in Investor Club, but then you also get Discord. And I have a fairly active Discord community. I have a lot of people sharing their trades. I have people sharing stuff about dividend companies, futures, zero DTE, learning material. There's quite a bit there. And then every other week, I typically do on Sundays around 8 p.m., I'll have what I call my Traders Club meeting. And we'll get together. We'll talk about a particular topic at the end of the the um, Zoom call. We'll have, you know, I'll answer any questions. Sometimes the members will jump in and answer questions. I actually have some members that I think are probably better traders than I am. So just wanted to mention that this next part of the video, I'll go into this, um, what I call my 4% budget. Uh, this is a spreadsheet I use and I've added a couple more pieces to it this time. So stay tuned. I think you're going to enjoy um, the changes I've made. Let's jump right in. Okay, here's my retirement budget with income. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on the budget itself. I just, it's broken down by all the different types of categories I might be spending money on. And then on the right, it just shows for the yearly basis. But I have noted in some cases where some of the expenses have gone up quite a bit. Um, my mortgage and credit union um, has been impacted recently. And, and my car insurance, a lot of the insurance has is, is gone up quite a bit. It seems like more inflation in that area than anything else. Um, but I, I list all these. I update them probably close to a monthly basis. This is what I'm typically spending currently. This is what I spend on a yearly basis. Um, some things also of interest is of my disability insurance typically ends when you hit 60, I believe it may be 62, which makes sense because then, you know, at 62, your social security would cover you. So there's no need for disability. So this 135 a month will go away. Um, I also have a life insurance policy that, that will stay in place. I believe I've got another 10 years on it too. Um, but if, if you have any questions about the budget, you know, just add a comment. Uh, but it, it, I find it interesting. I like to look at other people's budgets to compare to how I do things. What's unique with me is what's on the right side. I've got links to the 4% rule, which is um, an online website where you can throw in your numbers, you can play around. It's really good website. So I encourage you to take a look. This is... I've when I create these spreadsheets, it's something I like to look at, at least these retirement spreadsheets. So here I've got my taxable account total. This is the income side. This is how I can see, <clears throat> do I have enough income coming in to cover my expenses? This is my taxable cash. This is what taxable dividends I have. So these, this is all Schwab. Then I have my Fidelity IRA and my Fidelity Roth. And then I share how much cash. I do have a lot of cash currently in my IRA and Roth. And then I'll also share here how much dividends I currently bring in. Um, and down below, I also share the interest that I have coming in. So for, for the taxable, I've got about $85 now. And Schwab, I do have most of my cash in a money market account. I think it's SWVXX. And I end up making about 85 a month. Then on my taxable dividends, I'm right around 495 a month. And then for taxable premiums, and this is about what I, I feel like I can make in this account. Now, in this, this account in Schwab, it's mostly covered calls. I think I have one vertical put credit spread that I've had for quite a while. I believe it's in Polaris PII, but I plan to close it and then it'll just currently strictly be covered calls. Now I may change that. I may do a lot more. Um, the trades I'm going to talk about at the end of this, I may end up doing a lot more trades on IWM and XLE and some of the ETFs that I trade purely to make income. Um, but even with that, I'm still making pretty good monthly income from mostly covered calls of almost $801. Now Fidelity interest. This is that 4.99% interest. Now it's gone down. I've had several positions assigned to me re recently, UPS, um, Airbnb. So I am getting a little bit less interest, but I am earning a little bit more in dividends. 
And then the Fidelity premiums, this is where I'm doing most of my vertical put credit spreads, cash secured puts. And I'm also now, since I do own some, like I own you, like, like I just said, I own UPS, I, I own a Airbnb, I have Procter & Gamble, Corning. Um, so I've begun to earn pretty good dividends in those accounts too. All those companies I just mentioned pay pretty good dividends. Um, but I'm, I'm earning the most in my Fidelity IRA. That's where I do, I do all my different types of trades. Um, and I may, I may do more iron condors on my taxable down the road. I am trying to, uh, gain a lot of cash at this time, especially in my taxable. So I, I have a real estate deal going on and I'm trying to cash flow as much of that as possible. So, and then fidelity dividend, actual numbers from the accounts. So these, these are hardcore actual accounts. Now I don't have anything with the 4% rule or the part-time work, but I could easily add something in there. But since I'm in early retirement or in preparation for early retirement, um, I don't need that. Now in mid-retirement or full retirement, well, I, I might need to do some part. Well, the part-time work, I am actually earning something here. I should probably put something in there, but this is kind of showing you I, I don't need to. I'm bringing in a lot of cash. Now, the one issue to keep in mind is most of my premiums from options are in my retirement accounts. At first, they were mostly in my taxable accounts, but since I opened my Fidelity and moved all my retirement accounts over to Fidelity, almost all my premiums or significant portion of them, you know, 6027 versus 801 is in... Um, my retirement accounts, so they're not they're not taxable. My Roth and my IRA, and in Fidelity dividends, like I said, this number was lower in the past. So the dividends from what I do own in in these two accounts is is growing pretty nicely too. As I end up, you know, being assigned certain shares in different companies, or I, I at times I also will buy some shares if if need be. Um, so early retirement, you know, so that's the fifty nine and a half from 59 and a half until 67, which would be when I would get social security, or this would be mid retirement. If you look at it that way, I'm bringing in 85, 64, and I, that's plenty to cover my expenses. My budget's 69, 45. My net is 1680, 77. And then my, now I also throw in numbers here just so I could see, well, how am I going to be when I, you know, how, how will I be doing when I hit 67? And here again, I'm bringing in even more. And that mostly has to do with the, um, I would be bringing in about 2,300, 22, 2,300 in social security. So that's how I got up to that. So I'd have more money when I'm receiving my social security, which may mean, well, maybe if I want to spend more here, maybe I should, you know, maybe if I want to do that, $10,000 trip or buy, you know, a slightly nicer car. Well, maybe I should, because again, when social security kicks in at 67, I'll be making even more money. Um, net 1403. And I did build in some inflation. So still bringing in quite a bit and anything I don't use, I would reinvest back. Um, I don't really have like an emergency fund outside of my brokerages. I use those as my emergency fund, um, you know, so I don't have like a separate savings account. And then here's just some basic important notes. I paid down my HELOC. I am utilizing cash better. One thing I've failed to do that I'm looking to do now is to set up a savings account for my business. Um, I have a fair amount of cash in there, mainly to, so I have probably six months to a year for payroll but I should be using a savings account. Fidelity will do that for you. I believe Schwab would too. So I would just move money as needed. Um, and you can automate a lot of that. If the balance in my base business account gets to a certain point, I can just automatically have more money swept into it. Um, yeah, disability insurance is in ending soon. Social Security, two years out of date. Yeah, so the, that's based on my report. It may be almost three years now can pull more out of Social Security once it kicks in. So, um, well, I can pull more, more out of my retirement accounts, you know, 
until Social Security kicks in, to, you know, not to take Social Security at 62. A lot of people may argue, take it at 72, not, not even 67. Um, did better than S&P and NASDAQ from January 22 through December 23. And those are mainly because it's hard to beat the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ on bull years. It just goes up so much. But when I looked at it a little bit farther and I looked at some rough periods, I, I did better during that time period. Most of the other time, I also did pretty well, but I, I did not reach the heights, you know, on the really good years when the S&P makes crazy amounts as, as well as the NASDAQ. And then Vanguard considered customer to service, oh, customer no service by Clark Howard. So Clark Howard's been complaining about Vanguard. So if you're at Vanguard, you may want to consider moving to Fidelity or Schwab. I like Schwab's um, features better. I do like the interest and in the true sweep account at Fidelity. And then, again, Fed is likely to drop rates. Again, a quarter point. And I think that's going to continue. So let's jump into the next part. I don't want this video to go too long. So I've been putting strategies together. These are my favorite strategies. And I'm trying to identify... You know, if the market's pricey, you know, or the stock is pricey, you know, looking at that as well as how much cash you have and then identifying kind of what strategy. So if you have a lot of cash in the stock or ETFs and it's mid range of its 52 week range, then maybe the better strategies are cash secured puts, iron condors and covered calls. Now, if it's at the top and you have a lot of cash, then vertical put credit spreads and covered calls. The reason I would not do a cash secured put is because if it's pricey and the market drops, it could drop substantially. At least that's the way I'm thinking. Now, if the cash is high, 52 or eight week range is low, then it's perfectly okay. Cash secured puts, you bring in so much more cash, they're probably well worth it. Now, if you have low cash, it's almost always you should be doing vertical put credit spreads. There's actually an argument to always do vertical put credit spreads versus cash secured puts. Um, I don't know if I completely agree with that. Let me know in the comments what you think. But if if you have if it's in the middle range and you have low cash, you can also do iron condors and covered calls. Top, then if things are expensive, vertical put credit spreads, covered calls. Covered calls is questionable. I probably would take that out because, again, you are you don't have much cash and it's pricey. Um, you know, maybe not do covered calls. Well, no, actually, that would be covered calls. It'd be more low. So we'll add CC there. And if you have low cash and low 52-week range, you... You can do vertical put credit spreads, iron condors, covered calls. Um, I wouldn't recommend cash secured puts. Again, because you have very little cash, you you might be able to make one trade and you know that's all you can do. Now, my favorite cash generating strategies, again, is <clears throat> um, the Russell 2000 vertical put credit spread. I like to go 45 days out with a round of 15 delta. I currently have never had any of these get assigned. I've had a good number expire. I've only had to manage maybe two, three. And most of those, I believe, occurred maybe in 22. Um, another one I like is the Iron Condor. Um, and I've done it again with the Russell 2000. And I do a lower delta for that. So I do more like an 11 or 12 delta for both wings. Um which again, limits the risk. And just like with the vertical put credit spreads, another great opportunity is XLE. I've, I've done a lot of iron condors on XLE as well as vertical put credit spreads. XLE is, is the energy-based ETF. It has Exxon. It has a lot of the big name um, energy companies or oil companies. So um, I currently, I think I have one position open and with it, I just recently closed um, a trade with IWM. But this, this is just a list of all my different trades that I've done with IWM. I'm not going to go through these, but you can see it's, it's worked out quite well. Most of them were two contracts. You can see here. I did do, I think I recently did one trade with three contracts, but 
I stuck with one for a long time. Then I went to two contracts and now I'm playing with the idea of potentially going to three. Um, and you can see most of these are vertical put credit spreads. There are a few, few iron condors. The latest one, I just closed an iron condor yesterday. So here's the four trades I make. And it was very, very profitable, probably over 90%. Then I have, here's all the XLE trades. And I currently have one that expires, I believe, in October at 85.75. Yeah, right here. Um, right now, I believe XLE is right around 85. It's, it's gotten in the money and out of the money. But with XLE, again, I wouldn't have a problem being assigned. Actually, I probably wouldn't have a problem being assigned with IWM. It pays almost a 3.5 to 3.7 dividend um, yield on a yearly basis. But again... Um, I just found overall ETFs. I of all the ETFs I've done, and these aren't the these are just two of many. I, I I'll do. I have a number of other ETFs that I trade on, and I literally very few have ever been assigned. Most of them expire, and I've only had to manage, like I said, I think XLE once or twice, and probably IWN once or twice. So these these are trades that work out really well for me. Um, but that's what I wanted to share with you guys. Like I said before, this spreadsheet will be available to my uh, different memberships. If I miss something or you do something different or you disagree with how I do things, please leave a comment. I try to answer them all within 24 hours. So I do look forward to those comments. I do like to have the interaction. So thanks for spending the time watching the video and I look forward to seeing you next time.